How's that frame? Good there, mate? I actually think we're pretty good. Yeah? I feel like we're um, – how do you feel? Dare I say – dare I say – the best setup I've ever seen on your podcast. <laughs> the best what? Best setup I've ever seen in your podcast. Yeah, I guess. I love it. I love, I love how you're a, you're a musician. You record stuff. You've got all this equipment. You're an actor. You spend time on camera. And out of all the podcasts <laughs> I've done, this is the shittest setup that I've had to work with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why? Because I'm a, a recorder, I know sound and everything like that. I'm thinking, she'll be right. <laughs> yeah, she'll be right. Yeah, what could go wrong, you know? Fuck it. Yeah, and turns out, as we found out today, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, usually, you're lucky to have me. That's true. You didn't even charge me an appearance fee either, so I, I am, no, I am yeah. actually lucky to have you. I'll get the invoice later, will I? Yeah. You're kidding me? I'm typing it up on my laptop on the side. It's actually working. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Well, look, we've done it. Anyway, we made it. How are you, bro? I'm I'm great, man. I'm great. I um uh just enjoying life, living life, and living it to the fullest. Really. How are you, mate? Yeah, I'm not bad. I'm not bad. I'm envious of your. You've got a bit of almost a um almost a fro going on, mate. I've yeah, I've got a got a bit a bit of hair, a bit more of hair than uh when I last saw you. I think because yeah. I had a little bit of a. A little bit of a poodle cut before, but now it's uh, grown out a bit. Um, yeah, you've had a haircut, eh? Oh, yeah, a, a nice fresh, <laughs> fresh trim. You got to work with what you got, and these days it's not much. So, um, uh, yeah, I was going to say, mate, there's something different about you. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'm looking forward to when I can grow when I can grow a grey beard like a proper wizard. You know, yes. but I'm not. I'm not there. I've got a couple of spots here, but it's not. Oh, it's mate, not that's... there yet. That's when all the acting roles will just start flowing through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I actually kind of look my age, <laughs> Gandalf. If yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm like at the moment they're like, he's got it. Like he's he's bald, but he's not kind of <laughs> old enough to be bald. Is he? What's, is he a psycho? Is he a Nazi? What is he? What's going on? What's going on there? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I understand it. Like, why yeah. has he got no hair? Is he sick? Is he a Nazi? <laughs> like, is he in the military? That's kind of the feedback that I get for. Um, yeah, we tried every- to put you up in the audition. They said no Nazis, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The imagination of um, of casting directors is unfortunately not as not as um, vivid as we would we would like. No, well, I will. I still, and I will always remember the story you told me about going for a role, and um, they said, "Oh, yeah, we liked him. We just didn't like his beard." Yeah, you you know I can shave it, right? Yeah, it was actually the sideburns. They said, "Oh, we like, That's we really right. like him," but his sideburns were too long. Do you know what though? Serves you right for having sideburns. <laughs> Listen, that sounds awfully <laughs> like jealousy to me, Matt. That sounds, mate. You know. No, all I grow is sideburns. I can't grow anything else. <laughs> so I have anything I can grow, and there's a reason I don't have them. <laughs> what happens if you just don't shave? Uh, sideburns. Sideburns and and uh, I, I I don't get it here. I get it here, here, all under there, and just not there. So it's like okay. two little missing patches. Patchy. It's um, yeah. And is it is it quite sparse? Like, would you would you almost get the get the kind of um the the sensei wispy? I've never gone past the stubble pa- stubble stage because. Yeah. Why would I? I'm just like it. Just yeah, I don't know because people are like you got to go past that and it'll fill in, but I just can't go through that that stage of yeah, looking raggedy. Mm. Don't like it. It's, no, yeah, it's, no, you'll get the plenty, plenty, of, plenty of time for that, mate. mate plenty of years, plenty of years ago. Yeah. So how how long ago? How long ago was the voice? Now, man. <sighs> Mate, the voice would have been. Well, well, we, it was twenty twenty, was it twenty twenty? Yeah, yeah. Was it? yeah, twenty twenty was our year. Yeah, so, well, three so, yeah. because I moved to Sydney in uh, uh, three years ago in the August, and I, and it was prior to that August in the the Feb, Jan Feb, and the December prior when the voice was on. So, I think it was around twenty twenty. It might have been the end of twenty um, nineteen, going into twenty. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was right. It was right when COVID happened, eh? Because we did, 
we did our first two episodes and then lockdowns. Yeah. And we almost didn't get to finish the show. So, yeah, that was, yeah, 2020. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty flown. Yeah, 100%. Lockdowns and, ages ago. Yeah. And do you, um, you were, do you miss driving forklifts? <laughs> Mate, you know what? I have to consistently remind myself a lot that that was my reality, especially working on home and away when a lot of the times you get tired, you know, you get tired, long days, and sometimes you're just like, oh, God, I just can't be bothered with this certain thing today. And then you just got to check yourself and be like, forklifts. Mm. And uh, so, no, I don't. I don't miss driving forklifts. Uh, it'd be, I think it would be weird if I did. Um, yeah. But, you know, still got that skill there. So, well, that was – so what was – okay, so so let's – you – because I remember when we did The Voice, right, so I, we'd come from obviously very, very different um, places. I, mm. I kind of turned up deeply sceptical of the whole – you process did. because you know I'm I'm compared to you I'm old and jaded. And I was about to say just you're just jaded, mate. That's all. It yeah, is. yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. I'll leave the old bit out. But, um, and and so I turned up and I was very skeptical and didn't really trust any of the producers. Didn't trust the process. Mm. Didn't didn't know. Like I was very like I guess, and that was a good thing in a way because I've been in the entertainment industry long enough to know when I smell bullshit and there's a lot of it around. Um, and and you, on the other hand, had come from – how old are you now? I'm 27 now. 27, yeah, okay. So you were, you were what, 20, 24? I was 23 and, or 4, yeah. 4 maybe. And had come from what, yeah, driving for, forklifts in Perth and yeah. and not really doing anything in the entertainment industry. A long reality but, away from – a long way from that reality of what we were in, for sure. Just, just yeah. so different. Like as as you were saying, a bit jaded. I came and I was like, ah, starry yeah. eyed. You know, like come on, let's go. All right, yeah. the baby- I'm here. Oh, I can't believe it. Is that the half the ba- bridge? Whoa. <laughs> that's right. Maybe that's why. Maybe that's why we became mates. Like I, I needed a little bit more of your enthusiasm, and maybe <laughs> to you and, and to me, I saw you and I was like, hey, bro, come the fuck down. All right, they'll take advantage of you. You need. <laughs> Take and a breath. Like, ah, that's all cool. Yeah, that's right. Don't worry about it. Man. Yeah, if you're not careful, they'll put you in a matching two-piece pink suit <laughs> and you're like, and, fuck it, I'll wear the suit. Let's go. Yeah, and I did wear the suit. No, then, come on. And then Guy was like, that's a great suit. And he wore a pink one the next week. So I'm a bit of a fashion icon. I'm a, no, I do remember driving over the Sydney Harbour Bridge with you once and being like, how cool is this? The Sydney Harbour Bridge. I feel like I'm in America. What's that bridge? Is it in New York or something like that? <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. We were talking about the Golden Gate Bridge <laughs> yeah. in San Fran, weren't we? <laughs> Although it's pretty much the same thing, eh? And I was like, I was probably like, yeah, it's a pain in the ass because it always gets clogged up and it's really annoying. Yeah, nice views, but <laughs> <laughs> Just bursting bubbles everywhere that I possibly can. <laughs> I was just taking the blows. I just had so much enthusiasm. Um, that didn't last that long, though, being here during COVID lockdown and not much going on. But then obviously the, uh, this job came along. And, you know, the whole process of getting there, which a lot of people wouldn't know, is that we taped all to, a lot of it together. Um, uh, did we? I don't think we taped this audition together, actually. This was the one you were like, unavailable for this one. But um, uh, Was Home and Away a self-tape or did you go in? Yeah, no, it, it was... It was a self tape, and then I went in. I believe. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. I practiced it on self tape. That's right. It was all in the room. Yeah. So yeah. you were like, you're like, sensei, master, it's your time now. Go. Well, it is funny, hey, like because we we have actually a lot of, um, well, I guess in in I have walked the path that you are walking, and we're walking just ten, fifteen years earlier so it was kind of yeah. it was cool for me to be able to actually step into a bit of a mentor position and go hey man here's some shit that I've learned about mm. this exact thing that you're um potentially embarking upon mm. and I hope that I was able to bring some value to you rather than try and scare you out of it too much but you seem to have really taken the ball and run with it man yeah yeah and then when I got the job they're like who's been teaching you unlearn everything <laughs> no but it was um I mean, it was it was good. We had good times there. So it was, 
<laughs> the amount of times we had to do a slate over and over again, you'd just be standing in the background holding Roger, your dog, just patting him going. <laughs> so for anyone who doesn't, who doesn't know, when you record an audition, these days auditions are, um, yeah, you have to record them in your house and you send them off and then you've got to do what's called a slate, which is where you stand there and you go, hi, my name's Mark Furs, I'm uh, six foot seven and I live in on the Gold Coast and I'm with, this is my agent, blah, 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 you know, you do whatever you need to do. And, and then you send it off. But that happens to be the most awkward part of any audition by far. Yeah. Always. Apart from the audition that you did, where you were getting um, strangled to death by an invisible force. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> Mate, I rem- of course I remember it. I got footage of it and I watch it every <laughs> night to go to sleep. So the role was, <laughs> the role was for some, uh, I can't remember what the movie was for. Um, was it Mortal Kombat or something? It was Mortal Kombat, that's right. And the character <laughs> was just someone who gets his soul sucked out of him. So <laughs> basically, <laughs> I, basically, I just had to get my soul sucked out of my mouth. And I remember you saying to me, mate, this could be the one for you. you got a massive mouth. I reckon they're going to love you for it. And so I'm sitting there on my <laughs> Knees going, ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude. Like, filmed it quite a few times. But yeah, I reckon that's the one. And the funny part is, we're looking at different takes of me with my mouth open and going, yeah, that one's better, or that one's better. <laughs> It was just ridiculous. It was one of the funniest things I've ever seen, dude. Watching because because I, I just couldn't help but make you stuff it up, so you had to keep doing it because it was just so so ridiculous. And and but this is the thing that I think a lot of people don't realize about self tapes. They're really hard. Like like it's in on one hand, it's nice to be able to have the luxury of time, and you can do it in your own environment, and you can feel a little bit more comfortable in that regard. But on the flip side, you. It's also nice to go into a room and have some direction and have mm. a little bit of pressure and have someone kind of tell you what what you may be doing wrong or just give you, point you in the right direction for something. Yeah. Whereas this, you know, you're sitting there in my apartment at the time trying to act out getting your soul sucked out of your mouth. <laughs> Well, that's, you know, that was the one instant instance you just kept taking the piss out of me. But most of them, you know, you did do that guided directory sort of things. So that's when I started the job and I had that first audition with um, one of the directors in that audition. I knew how to take notes because that's what we yeah. did, except yeah. for that one audition where you just kept filming it over and over again and laughing at me. Well, yeah, because you didn't commit to it, Matt. You need to, you're getting your soul sucked <laughs> out of your body, okay? You need to commit to this. This is real life real focused. Life. I reckon you just do it again, eh? Yeah. <laughs> I even remember sitting down and just being like, letting you go, this is great. Yeah. I, I'll try and find that video somewhere and dig it up and I'll just I'll just chuck it up on the social media <laughs> just, for, just for the lols, just so people know what we're talking about. You know, do it, I can do it for you now. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the self tape the self tape world, hey, it's um it's a lot of it's a lot of work, learning lines, learning characters, reading scripts, and you just kind of get like like auditioning in general, even when you're going into the room is is a lot of work, but at least there's a process where you go there and you kind of feel like, okay, cool, I met the people, hopefully I made a good impression. We talked before and after the scene and and you know, hopefully you may be what they want. But with the self tapes, it's even you just send a thing off. Yeah. And just probably never hear anything ever again and just be yeah. like, okay, thanks. I really wish that they were all, all all just in the room auditions, hey. And it's also like you get to see so much more about a person and their charm and charisma in, in, in person. But then again, there's the other side of that where it's like all the audience is only going to see this person on the screen. So if they do the whole audition process through the screen, that's purely what they're basing it off. So Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, how, um, how does this person play? On screen because because that's right. I mean, there are certain people that just look really good on camera, and they and you might see them in real life, and and it's not the same. But then for some reason, they look great on camera, and vice versa. There's other people that are really like beautiful in in real life, but then on camera, it just doesn't translate for whatever reason. So that's yeah. not a bad point. I'm sure that that directors and casting agents and and producers are happy that they can just flick through because because this is the thing that I that I know from talking to a casting director has changed in the past 
Oh, well, no, this was a normal director, sorry. He was saying that in the past what would happen is he'd go in to a casting office, the casting director will have compiled their their favourites and they're waiting in the waiting room. That's us sitting there nervous, jiggling our legs, trying to remember what the lines are and, you know, psych yourself up to it. And then you go in and you do your audition. The process takes at, at minimum 10 minutes. Mm. And so how many people can you really get through? Yeah, you get yeah. to meet them in person. How many people can you get through in a day? I don't know. Not that many. Whereas now they just go, give me all self-tapes and they go, cool, I want to see every single person who auditioned, give me all their videos. And they go, play, one, two, nah, next, play, mm. nah, next, play. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I like their look. Are they any good? Nah, next, play. Oh, this person. You know, and they just fizz through 150 auditions. Yeah. It's essentially, it's like that look first. What do they look like? And if you've got the look, then they look and they're like, oh, how are they playing this? Oh, he's kind of getting the direction wrong. We'll go to the next one, even though yeah. you don't know what direction they want. And so That's it's just it. all of this, it's just such a risk and a gamble and you just got to kind of, um, I thought I'd shout out to everyone. I'm drinking Coke Zero, not wine. So. <laughs> Just a, hey, we're just going to do a podcast. Maybe just let me pour a cheeky mulled wine. <laughs> Like, uh, like a def- port to loosen up a bit. Definitely should have poured it in a different glass because now every time I take a swig, it looks like I'm having wine. Yeah. What do you think is worse for you, Coke Zero or Coke Regular? And why do you drink Coke Zero and not Diet Coke? Um. Okay. A couple of questions. First one. I don't really have an opinion on which one is better for you and which one isn't. The reason I drink Coke Zero. <laughs> It's because I love it. You, the answer to your first question is I don't give a fuck. Next question. <laughs> Essentially, <laughs> wait. Let me think about it for a second. I don't care. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's essentially like Coke Zero. Yeah, just don't want you know the sugar for the for the weight loss purposes. Okay. Um, and Diet Coke, and I just think Coke Zero tastes better than Diet Coke. I never got around Diet Coke. What's the difference? And I, I don't know what the difference is between the two, but they taste different. And no one drinks Diet Coke. Well, very rarely do I see someone that's like, oh, I want a Diet Coke. It's like, I thought that was a drink that stopped being made in 2011. But it's- <laughs> <laughs> what? So what's the difference? Isn't there Coke no sugar as well? Yeah, there's Coke no sugar, there's Coke Zero, and there's Coke, like, make your mind up and just make one. We've had all the sa- isn't it all the same thing? Essentially, maybe they use different um, artificial sweeteners or whatever it is. I don't know. Maybe yeah, it's right. a different. It's a different one in each of them. I have no idea. But I'm like, just, just relax. Make one. Yeah. I don't know. There's no one that's going to be like, I can't believe they stopped making Diet Coke. Drink Coke Zero. <laughs> same thing. I've had enough of you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, yeah it's just purely just because of this i don't want to get fat you know yeah okay okay i don't feel like that's really much of an issue for you you know bastards like you with a with a lightning <laughs> i feel like you i thought you were going to mention this at some point today i mean just before this podcast yeah. i finished a white bread sandwich with butter mayonnaise mortadella and ham and nothing else and it was about nine this thick this thick of meat <laughs> I looked at it, I went and bought it and I was like, oh, mate, this is loafy even you. That's like that's like Maddie's first sandwich, you know. Make a sandwich, dude. You're a fully grown man. What's happening? Well, I just got back from work and there was that was all I had in my fridge and I had a bloody podcast to do. Um, so This is why we need women in our lives, man. We need to get you a girlfriend mm-hmm. who can make I've been you waiting. a I half have- decent sandwich. I want a girlfriend. I've been waiting, but I, I want to be swept off my feet and I want to be Fallen off, fallen, yeah, for a while. But I, I just, yeah, I haven't seen really been properly with anyone since the last. I think the last girl that you were around for, that you were aware of, that I'd okay. written song, which was a you know short term anyway. Um, but I think ever since I've just been like busy, yeah, and not phased. Yeah, and no, look, I'm, I'm, I'm taking the piss, man. I think it's, I think it's great. You, you're 27, like. Yeah, it's cool. You 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 got things to do. You're working on yourself. You're working on your music. You're working on your acting, and um, good for you for not just getting in a relationship for the sake of getting in a relationship. Like it's, it's. A, I, I think you're in a great position to actually get into a good one because you're happy being single. And then when I've said this before, you know, I think that's that's kind of where you need to start. You have got to be happy mm. being on your own, 
And then, because how can you be happy being with someone else if you're not happy on your own? You're just going to dump your own junk onto another person. It yeah, and I, I think that's the problem these days is that a lot of people kind of just settle for like the, oh, like and then and then they end up getting further down the line in their relationships and resent each other because they're not madly in love with this person, you know. So um, I've just always been like, you know, I want to be madly in love with someone before I'm going to, even if I have like a few dates with someone or whatever and I'm, I don't feel like I'm, totally like infatuated by this person then i'm just like just yeah move on yeah i think that's a good call man i yeah. think that I, I think that's a sign of of feeling secure in yourself you know yeah you, you, you want someone that's gonna yeah that's gonna enhance your life and it's gonna be exciting and if it's not if you if you don't feel that that magic stuff then then yeah what's what's the point i mean it's just Filling a void that doesn't need to be need to be filled, and yeah. and, and, you're, and you may miss out on on meeting that one person who who does make you feel all that. You know, the last thing you want is to be is to meet someone and then have to go. Oh no, well I'm kind of seeing someone that I don't mm. really feel very strongly for. But wow, fireworks with this other person. That's a horrible situation to be yeah. in because then what do you do? Do you you can't you you don't want to be cheating on someone. That's that's shit. That's mm. not a cool way to behave, but you also like don't want to pass up the real thing. Yeah. Then yeah, what a mess. Yeah, I agree. Um, no, I just I, I, I you know, and I've seen many functional relationships. I like yours and um, your partner Lolly's, for instance. It's, you know, I've seen a lot of them that work really well, and they're actually our best mates. So I'm like, I don't know that it's out there. Just gotta. Yeah, it's definitely there. And look, look, man, it's it definitely takes work. It takes. Mm. It, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of work. It's a wave. From my mm. experience, it's 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 about in being able to have the foresight to understand that it 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 gets good and it gets bad, yeah. and being able to go, what do we need to work on to figure out why this is bad? What's mm. because like Lolly and I've been together for thirteen years, yeah, Jeez, maybe even maybe even more, and. And the amount, like we were 24 when we got together, you know, I'm turning 38 in May. Like think about how like I'm a completely different person now than I was when I was 24, than I was when I was 28, when I was 30. Mm. It's There's so much personal growth that goes on and same thing with Lolly. She's she's a drastically different person. Both of our values are completely different. We're, we're both parents now and obviously we're parents of the same child and, yeah. and we're it's a completely different, completely different life. And in order to be able to figure out how to do that effectively together, we have to change and we have to work on our dynamic. And it's fucking hard, man. Honestly, yeah. we've been through some really tough times as a, as a couple. And, um, and it's, yeah, it takes, it takes a lot of work. But for, for me, I'm at a point where I'm like, well, I don't want to, the things that we've been through together, this whatever it is that that has us connected, is so much more powerful than the potential of a, something new. Like, man, we got such such history, and we're tethered now as parents. And um, you know, like the other last week, Lolly was away; she was in New Zealand, and so I was just taking care of Soma, our daughter. And um, and we did a bunch of fun things. Went to this, went to this like water park, but it's not the same when, when, when lol, when her mum's not there, like I want to share these new things that our daughter can do. And, and, you know, just if you think about, oh man, imagine if we weren't together, that would mm. suck. It'd be horrible to not be able to go, hey babe, look what our daughter's doing. Yeah. 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 You know? Absolutely. As, as well as what it, what it needs for her. Anyway, look, that's a long way down the track of long-term relationship. And yeah, we get here. <laughs> That's all you got all that to look forward to, mate. <laughs> now, what bloody podcast am I on? Have I got, yeah, right. Yeah, this is deep and meaningful. So I try. I, I can't help it, man. I try. Sometimes I try and keep it keep it surface, but ooh, here we go. Well, yeah, I mean, you pretend like I don't know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> deep and meaningful. Yeah, no, it's good. You got to you got to get to the core of everything, you know. You know, Mersey just just flying solo though. You are at the moment, mate. <laughs> Mate, you put stuff on. You got shit to do. I've got shit to do. I've got a house to clean, and <laughs> no one's going to do it but me. So, what time do I have for anyone yeah. else in my life? 
when I can't look after myself. You got gourmet sandwiches to build. <laughs> Mozzarella and ham all the way. No, I yeah. just uh, yeah, emotionally unavailable. Actually, I've got. Well, I mean, one of my next songs is that is about that, which I'm going to be. I don't know when this podcast is going to be coming out, but um, I have a. It should be Good Friday um, that I'm going to put it out. Cool. And um, it's about commitment issues. <laughs> And but essentially, I really realised when I was writing that song that I had commitment issues because of what we were talking about prior. Is that I didn't feel like I was completely swept off my feet by the relationship that I was in. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't feel like I was ever fully committed to it, and that's why I was always like, um, you know, I know you're going to be moving away eventually. We'll just do this as it is and just keep it as this. And that was just because I knew that that wasn't the person that I wanted to be with. So I had serious commitment issues around it. And then that was how this, my next songs come about. So um, leaning into the idea of commitment issues, but I don't really think that I do have commitment issues. It's just that I haven't found the right one. I actually think that as far as commitment issues go, that's a pretty good one. That's a, mm. that's a, um, that's a good, that's a, maybe that's bullshit, but it's a good excuse. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I call it bullshit. <laughs> no, no, look. Uh, yeah, no, I believe you. I know that's true. I know that's true and good on you. Yeah. Good well, on you, you know. There's wait, been, wait for the right one. Yeah, and there's been many a times prior to that where I would jump into it and I'd be like, well, this girl is amazing. But um, mm. I never really felt that way about this one, but I just thought that she was a really cool girl. So, um, mm. yeah. Mm. When you – okay, when you write music, what's, what's your process? Because – I'm always intrigued about this with other musicians because I, I tend to think in, in um, like guitar riffs. That's the first thing, almost always, that comes for me. I hear a guitar riff, or I try and figure out a guitar riff, and then I try and come up with a, with some chorus chords, and then I try and come up with a chorus melody. And the lyrics are the last thing that comes that comes for me. And to be honest, for me personally, lyrics are quite a chore. Mm. Like I, I, I spend this time wrestling with them and trying to. Trying right. to get the right ones, and um, and it's been it's definitely my I think my weakest part of of songwriting. Um, what what's your process with that? Where I'm, where do you start? I'd say I hate lyrics as well, but um, first of all, before I say that, I just want to go. It's a great day to be alive. Um, so <laughs> you're on that. You're on that recording. I'm on that recording. Yeah. Um, yeah, I look. I was always a. Um, I'd play chords and just sing out random melodies and whatever that was. I would try and make a chorus because I always start with a chorus, um, as many writers do. But I would try and start with a, just a hooky chorus of whatever it is, singing whatever random lyrics. Sometimes mumble tracks, and um, then from there I would go to you know going the verse and then and doing all the lyrics. But lately what I've been doing for my whole EP is I've been co-writing everything, um, which I really, cool. really enjoy. I really enjoy co-writing and I love the idea of lots of creators being in the room and getting getting things that uh, – just stuff that come in which you wouldn't necessarily think about yourself. And I remember there's yeah. some melodies in some of the songs that one of the guys, Aaron, came up with and it was just very like – it was so not me. It was kind of like the the weekend style, this melody. But then when I went and sang it, I was like, wow, this feels really cool. But I would never have thought of that myself. So this mm. EP I've got, I had um, Nick, my producer, I wrote some songs, just me and him. And then his girlfriend, Danny, um, Aaron, another girl, and another girl, Moana as well. And then one of the songs we have pretty much all of us on it. And um, yeah, oh, cool. just really collaborative. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, the, that's one of the greatest things about about co-writing, you know, writing a song with other people is you can steal their ideas and pretend that they're yours. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm just like, this is, this is great, guys. I love collaborating. Who is that? I'm going to take all the credit for that epic yeah. idea that you come up with. No, you didn't no. come up with it. No, but I mean, you credit them all, don't you? But Yeah. No, but it's yeah. but but as far as the way that ideas work and creative – it's, it's, it, the way creative scenarios pan out, pan out is you either throw something in there or someone else throws something in there. And even though that, even if that is absolute junk, it still may spark an idea from someone else, and so on and so forth. Till you get to this point that you've you've created something together that you never would have, none of you ever would have created on your own. Yeah. If it's a true creative experience, yeah. which is super cool because you know we all have our own creative 
box that we fit into, whether we, no matter how much we can try and branch out of that. And then you have someone else who's like their creative box is just a completely different color Mm. and shape to yours. And they throw something out there and you're like, whoa, that is, I don't know about you, but my, my instinct is usually with those quite often is, I think I hate that. Mm. And then, and then this, but there's something about it that makes you want to hear it again. You go, hang on a minute. Mm. Maybe that, maybe that's actually awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe that's great. Let's. And then you fumble around and put your own spin on that, and you create this thing that's like, whoa, look at this little, little collaborative Frankenstein musical Frankenstein that we've created, and it and it becomes this, yeah, this fascinating. It's, it's nice to have someone else as well to be like, I love that what you're doing right now. When you're like, ah, no, that shit, but they're like, no, that's really cool and go with that direction and to just have kind of that input coming from, a, you know, outsourced. To, so it just doesn't feel like it's just you shitting on your own ideas most yes. of the time, you know. Yes. Um, well, because well, sometimes we need help in in discerning which parts of our ideas are good and which parts are shit because yeah. our ego gets in the way, you know. Sometimes we can go down this path that is just, for some reason, we think it's a good idea. For some reason, I'm like, yeah, this is a great, this is great. This is going to be so, I'm not going to let go of it. But, but in reality, it's just not going to work. It's just not good. It's not very. Check this melody kind of, out. Baby, take your clothes off. Yeah. <laughs> it's sick. No, I, and that's the biggest thing I find about the, um, the collaborating is it really forces you to leave your ego at the door. And now with songwriting, I believe like, when I was younger, I was a bit egoic about it where I'd be like, oh, I can write a song. Whereas now I'm like totally the opposite. I'm like, no, I want to have people working with me. I, I, mm-hmm. I need that. I need that. And I, en- I really enjoy it. Um, so I think that's what's been, been really great. about. And the songs that have come out of this session are, are just, it's the best ones I've ever had. So that's cool. Good mm. for you, man. And it's and it's and it's smart, you know, put what do they say? If you're the if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Yeah. You know, so you put you put yourself in, in rooms with with way better musicians than you. And then, was, <laughs> then you can I've never so I've never been in the I've never been in the wrong room my whole life. <laughs> that's great. No, but to your to your credit though, man, you you are a a highly capable musician. I was you you may not appear as though you are, yeah. but you are, yeah. you know, like I've, hey guys. I've always, I've always, <laughs> hey, Alan, I've, I've always been impressed with your, with your piano playing and your guitar playing and your musical knowledge. Like, like I remember the first time you sat down behind a piano, I was like, oh yeah. shit, this guy's, this guy's legit. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you know, you can, you can jam dude. It's, um, did yeah. you, and you, you studied, right? You did, you you did that in uh, after school in uni, right? Yeah, I did a bachelor degree um, of contemporary music for four years at WAPA. Um, okay. So yeah, I graduated probably a couple of years prior to the Voice when, and then was forklift driving, and I'm still paying that hex debt off now, which is not great. But you know, it's um, That's disgusting. That's it, so it's, shit. It sucks. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, a lot of the, the money I might be getting from being on home and away is just getting thrown into a hex debt, but and expensive rent. Yeah, it's actually I I've, I've I've been talking about it on TikTok a little bit. I've just had enough. Like the, you get paid a reasonably good salary to be on a show like Home and Away, but you have to live in Sydney with ridiculously yeah. high rent that keeps going higher and higher and higher. I've got it. You know, I'm, I'm paying hex debts and even the little things like cars. Like in WA, you you get a pink slip for your car, you pay your rego. Bob's your uncle. Just keep paying your rego. Here, it's just slips. You know, and get, mm. getting it roadworthy over and over again. Just that's mm. uh, yeah, it's pretty. Um, just like it. if I, you know, if you'd been on this salary living anywhere else in Sydney, you'd be like, all right, I'm feeling comfortable. But in Sydney, you're like, still, is that a dog behind you? Is that Miss you? Jane? Yeah, it's Miss Jane. Let me grab Jane. Jane. <laughs> so, little backstory. Jane was uh, my little little favorite favorite dog when I used to go to Fursey's house all the time. Yeah, Jane's the best. She's getting real old now, man. She's Jane. getting, yeah. Jane. Let me try and grab her. Come on, Daddy. Come on. Oh. She gets, um, she's very old. Oh, she's, she's 14 or so. She gets cute. quite. She gets quite she confused. <laughs> Look how cute she looks. Jane. I actually forgot, I forgot that she was in here, actually. Um, I know. She has that innate ability to just be in a room for yeah. t- 
12 just, hours just and you just don't know she's there. Yeah, she's, well, she's, you know, she's an elderly woman these days. She, she yeah. basically is just like, oh, it's, I'm just going to, I'm just going to be, just be napping. All right. I'll be, I'm, I'll be, I'll be here. I'm I'll just under here. the table. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. She's sick. Yeah, man. Coming back to what you were talking about, like, like, you know, things are at a, at an interesting place financially when someone in your position is, is feeling the heat, you know, you're, you're unattached, you have a great paying job and yet you're still like, fuck, this is hard work. Yeah. Like imagine that that's, things are going on, you know, like it's, mm. it, it's imagine being, imagine being someone who's, you know, got a couple of kids, you know, a big a family, they've got a mortgage. It's, it, it's hard. Dude, this, that's why we left Sydney because it's just we realise, man, we're never going to be able to buy a house and have a backyard for our daughter if we stay in Sydney because we'll have to both have complete massive career changes and work all the time and then never spend any time with our child. Yeah, um, it's 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 really, you know, there's a lot of great things that are, there's a big appeal here for me. I do love a lot of things here, but there's a, the, the you know, the counter of that, it's just there's so many things that are just expensive here and, yeah, you're paying for that quality of life, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little different to um, sleepy, old, sleepy Old Perth. Yeah, different to Sleepy Old. You know, where you, like Goldie though, Gold Coast, it's, it's kind of one of my dream destinations. I think there's great surf beaches down there. You just go down and just be at the beach and live the life, maybe work at a bar, I don't know. Dude, the Gold Coast is awesome. Honestly, yeah, yeah. it's better than I thought it would be. Mm. You know, you move to a new city and you kind of hope for the best. I'd never lived here mm. and I've never really spent that much time here. I've got a few friends up here and uh, came up and hung out a few times and you scope it out as well as you can, but it's a, it's always a big call if you've never lived in that city before. But, it, dude, it's it's awesome. Mm. I love it. It's It's like the northern beaches of Sydney, but except it's got a highway and it's, uh, cost of living is really low compared to Sydney. I yeah. love it up here. I mean, so many people move up here and all the locals get really it. pissed off. You, you, know, know, hate it. you know what they call them? <laughs> Do you know what they call them? Uh, blow-ins. The bloody blow-ins, that's right. Because <laughs> my sister's yeah. fiancé lives there and he's, he calls them blow-ins. There's yeah, all right. blow-ins here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the irony is almost everyone's a blow-in if you <laughs> yeah. go back far enough. There's Sorry, not that mate. many. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You were a blow-in, mate. Yeah. Didn't, yeah. didn't realise yeah. you helped build this city. Yeah, that's right. And this is what you get for having a really great city. People want to come and live there and exactly. spend time there. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's awesome up here, man. So, yeah, come on up. Yeah. I mean, we've, I've only seen you once up there, haven't I? Yeah. Yeah, about well, that. What's, so, so what's the um, what's the what's what's your home and away life look like? You've been on for how long now? Uh, I have been on home and away for three years now. Um so wow. it's uh yeah it's gone really fast right like yeah real fast yeah. um look at me now living in my own apartment by myself he's all grown up now he's got no money in the bank that's why no um <laughs> yeah it's been great it's just it, you know it's it's a busy schedule it's moving around all as you may know um it's 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 it moves around a lot no day is exactly the same which is 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 really hard but also really great about it as being a creative i find that when you have a job where everything is the same every single day, it kind of, it gets a bit mundane. So I yeah. really like having that variety of things being different every day. Um, but the schedule is forever changing when you have things like COVID or someone's sick or whatever, it, things can just get turned on its head very, very quickly. So you're kind of pretty much on, on call all the time. So there's not really a lot of space or time to do other things. So me trying to do a music career at the same time and, you know, record and release music and do gigs and all that sort of stuff is really hard. And I think that's why I agree with my management to pull back on the gigs and just focus on the online and social things because I feel like last year I was self-managing myself for music on top of this job and I think my stress levels were sitting at about 80% all year. I was just like, I just had enough by the end of it. Cool. I was just pulling my hair out. Um, yeah. And so... Yeah, it's nice to have a management team around me now and just I've gotten a lot better at balancing everything, balancing my life and then just uh, when I'm not, I, I check in, I check out and then I get on with my life and I try not to make the show my life even though you spend so much time there and I think mm. it's only natural that everybody does that when they're there. It just becomes their, you know, their thing. 
Yeah, well, I talked about this with um, when I had Toddy on the podcast. Todd, Todd back, Todd Science back in the day played Aiden, yeah. and um, and Toddy and I were on at the same time. And I and I know from chatting with you, the schedule is just as just as relentless as it was now, as just as relentless now as it was back when I was on the show. It's uh, man, it's it's more full on than any acting schedule you will ever come across. Yeah. It's, well, I mean, it's, essentially there's, there's no other way to put it than we are the busiest actors in the country. We are, we are the busy. There's, there would be no one that's busier because we essentially are working every week of every year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and no matter yeah. who you are, whether you're Jacob Elordi or any of these actors going, you know, they, they film a set, they stop, and then they move on to the next thing, whereas we just don't stop. We just yeah. keep going the whole year. So, Yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah, it really is. It really is a a, uh, a brutal and uh, very beneficial training ground, man. Because yeah, mm. if you can if you you can power through with without any luxury of any time, man, you can you can really you can because you've got to think on your feet a lot. You know, we've just we've just pumped out an intense three minute scene, and then that one's done. Cool, on to the next one. Go, let's mm. go. Let's set up, run the lines. Go. You know, yeah. that's like oh, that's a lot of pressure. It's yeah. not easy to do that. It's it's. I actually, it's, I actually, this might not be a good way to do things, but I actually did. I started experimenting a little bit with um, learning my scenes later and later, so closer and closer to actually going on to set. Sure. Till eventually, I'm at the point now where I can just read it before I go on set, and it can stick in my mind if I need to do that. But <laughs> I, I kind of did that. I did that to explore and experiment and test my mind and also my confidence and ability so that you know, I don't ever get to the stage where I've got all these scenes and I'm like, if I'm, if I haven't read all of them six hours for a night, then I'm going to freak out. So I like kind of actually probably, it's probably not the best way to do things, but I did it to test myself to sort of push the boundaries and be way more comfortable within myself so that when sh- shit gets hectic, which it does, you know how to handle it. You can cope with it. Yeah, that look, that's, that's, I'm not surprised that I did the same thing. That's yeah. an insider truth that I think, honestly, I most it. people end up doing people. because it's too much pressure, man. Yeah. It's too, it's because you have to be able to, well, for one thing, your mind just gets better at learning those lines. Yeah. You, you just, it's a skill. It's and a, the more you do it day in, day out, whatever part of your brain that is, allocated to remembering that and regurgitating that as your character it grows you get mm. better at it yeah plus you're totally right you have to manage your stress levels and your ability to function because if you're I've got 14 <laughs> scenes tomorrow I've got to learn every single one of them back to front yeah it's just that night it's just so much to, to you're just yeah yeah, I get it, dude. And maybe you know, maybe you know that's a little, you, naughty, but, a little bit naughty. It's a little bit naughty, but you also come across a way more relaxed on screen as well. Yeah. If you are that way, um, you don't look highly strong. You just kind of. But this is this is for scenes that, as you may know, on this show, there's a lot of times where you're in the diner and it's just, hey, mm. hi, what's going on? Oh, yeah. oh wow, I can't believe yeah, you, that. You prioritize um, your scenes. You, oh, yeah. I've got four lines in this scene. I don't need to learn that. That's fine. I, I can do that, that on the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's, and then you just kind of really get to the point where you learn the scenes that you need to learn. Um, yeah. When it gets to the point where the crew are like, "Bloody Mevins doesn't know his lines," then that's when okay, I've pushed it too far. Yeah, I've gone too far. Which, funnily enough, has never happened to me, even though you would expect it. To, it just yeah, it hasn't happened. I I think maybe that for us as well, it's like the song thing of always learning lyrics or something like that. Maybe that's mm. something that's. Kind of, I can't remember lyrics, dude. I can remember lines, right? But I can't. It, it is. I can remember lyrics, but it is so much harder for me to remember lyrics than it is. Yeah. How how are you with lyrics? You, can you just lock them in? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Usually, I need to know what your secret is, dude. Because I get to the point where I think it's a little a little worm that's gotten in my mind where I forgot lyrics in a relatively high stakes gig a couple mm. of times, and ever since then. Oh, it's like this thing. Oh, you can't. You'll forget them. You're going to forget mm. the words. And, well, there's, and, and, and there's no real. Yeah, there's no real secret. It's just high IQ, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you can't, have, can't be taught. Do you can't have, be taught. Do you, do you, you're like, you're like, sick of this guy's shit already. How to hang up? 
Um, have you? Do you have like an iPad when you perform your gigs? I do. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the ticket. That's the way to do it. The. <laughs> yeah. My. Yeah. It certainly. Do you remember? You. <laughs> do you remember when I played gigs when I moved to Sydney, and I had, yes. <laughs> and I had the, uh, the, the 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 music stand. You know, it's like a music stand, and I used to sit it flat, and I'd sit my yes. laptop on it. <laughs> I'm on the like, top of a music stand. On the top of a music stand has the ability to just fall backwards. And I'm, yeah. I'm that sitting upwards, scrolling. Oh, yeah, got that. No, I don't got that. I just, it was like, it was like, what is he, a DJ? Is he, what's like, he doing here? I'm the, I'm the, the king of wing it. I'm the king of like, yeah, she'll be right. And we all, <laughs> and we run in, we run into that today when we tried to start this call and my laptop yeah. wouldn't. Fire up the internet. I yeah, should be right. Should be right to it. I eh? get your phone or something. What's the big apps? This tends to be a pretty um, common trait within creative folks. We we you know it's very it's much harder. It's, it's we move very lateral, and and following through with something is uh, much more difficult. Mm. And um, I, I share I share your pain. Unfortunately, well, look when you become a dad, you kind of I've I've learned fuck. I gotta. I got to get my act together. A lot of that stuff, and I have. Mm. It's just something that when you've got a little person counting on you to follow through, mm. you got to follow through. And also, a wife, she deserves for me to follow through. But you know, yeah. I, I definitely have gotten better at it. But man, trust me, my innate um, behavior is just like shit. Be right, <laughs> I still leave things to the last minute all the time, all the time, dude. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I know yeah, I remember you a bit like that actually. And I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just chill. Don't worry about it. What could go Don't wrong? Usually everything. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Oh, yeah, well, okay, so so how how um do you are you allowed to talk about your future on home and away? How long are you planning on being there? Or is this hush hush you don't want to you can't well, talk about it? Top secret. I mean, <laughs> top secret. You heard it here first. Um, I, in not, you know, I wouldn't speak in like kind of specific time frames, but um, you know, my, I've, I've always considered staying on a little bit longer, just until I try and get my music up and about. And that's not to be like, oh, I'm just using home and away until I get my music. It's more just like I'm enjoying it while I'm there. I'm, it's great to have an income, and you know, it's a really good job. But at the mm-hmm. same time, I've always wanted to put music out and release records and 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 do that too. So um, I just want to have those both going at the same time and and try and build this music career so that when the time comes that I have to leave the show, because it's not always your choice, then I will um, go straight into music and I'll be doing shows and releasing music and then also still auditioning for acting stuff. And the great thing that that's going to have, the, the power that I feel I'll have is that I'm not going to be stressing about whether I get an acting role or not. And a lot of the time when people are like, oh, I really wanted that one. But but for me, it's like I've got my music project going and I'm doing that on the side so that I'm not stressing out every single time I get a no because we know that every 99.98% of the time you get no's. So Yeah, well, I mean, good on you, man. It's a great position that you're in to be on. To be well, look, just to have a have a great job, let alone the fact that it's home and away. You're on mm. home and away, and you're also making some really cool pop music and putting it out there. These two things kind of go hand in hand. I totally get it, mate. I think it's I, I'm I'm proud of you. You're, you're mm. using the platform that you're on, and people enjoy it. You're working hard with it, and uh, yeah, I, yeah s- I think I still remember when I first put my when I put my first song out, and I got a text message from you, and he goes, "You're doing it, Mepsy." <laughs> You're, you're bloody doing it, son. <laughs> I'm so all, proud. All in capitals, exclamation mark. You're doing it. Yeah. Yeah, like this because this is the thing, you know, <laughs> after me being in the point that I'm at, being able to look back on you and your journey with it, it can pass you by. Like it feel, it doesn't feel like, I mean, in a way it feels like a completely different lifetime when I was on the show, but also I remember it pretty vividly, certain parts of it, and it's like, wow, dude, that was – I finished on that show in 2008. Yeah, wow. Like that's a long time ago, man. That's but ages, it, it just, yeah. Yeah, it can, just, it can just fly through. It really um, does. It, it, it flies. Like the last three years yeah. I'm just like, whoa. Yeah. Um, yeah, haven't aged, but <laughs> – 
<laughs> you haven't matured either. Well, that's more what I meant by it. Still making yourself butter and ham sandwiches yeah. on probably probably just standard white bread, isn't it? Drinking your Coke Zero. Three words. She'll be right. <laughs> so how how um how famous are you these days? <laughs> um, do, you, do you know that's actually quite funny? Just as you're saying that, one of our friends Graham from The Voice that did it with us. He just sent a video and he was with Ella, who was also on The Voice with us, and he's like, "Oh, it's it's just, this is to Matt." She doesn't know how famous you are now. <laughs> like, oh, he's so funny. But no, it's it's not. There's, I mean, you know, sometimes on the outside people think that there is a fame to it. Um, maybe there is a little bit. Like you, if you go into r- rural towns um, within Australia, then you get a lot more people that will come up to you. But within Sydney itself, no one really cares. Um <laughs> Oh, it's a bloke from home away. Yeah. No, like no one really cares here. So it's kind of, it, it is nice to not be hassled all the time. But, you know, we still have the fans at Palm Beach. A lot of people that come from England still, still massive yeah. in England and Ireland. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily, I, my perfect way to describe the home and away quote unquote fame is that you get a nice, um, a nice experience with a lot of the different things. Like you get it, the publicity, you get like to experience that. You get to experience fan interactions. And it's a lot of this is all at like a mediocre level. So you can really train up and then know how, how you can deal with it and you can be prepared to deal with it if you ever take off to a whole new level. And I think mm. that's what's really nice about it. Maybe when you were on the show, it was very, very different because I think back then there was no Netflix or anything like that. So Home and Away was, uh, was bigger and... You and, um, you know, Hemsy and those boys back in that day probably would get get it all the time when you'd leave the house. Yeah, it, well, that's actually a good point. It, it, it has the um, the ecosystem has changed since mm. then. It, we're, we're, yeah, there was no social media, Instagram. I don't think it had, it maybe had just, just, ta- just was starting, but it mm. definitely hadn't taken off. I didn't have an Instagram account. So there was really like no social media. Um there was n- no streaming really. It mm. was st- at the very end of the time when you watched your favourite show on the TV at the time that it aired and that was how you watched it. Mm. So it was the audience was much more captive. So, yeah, it was a lot more of that old school, oh, there's the guy from the TV. Mm. And people were, yeah, people were handed their entertainment, whereas now, yeah, you you can – you can choose what you want to watch when you want to watch mm. um, and and how to access your favourite people. So so it's it's got to be – well, that's kind of why I ask because it's got to be weird now. Like I think about what it would be like now and I can't really imagine it because it's completely different. You've got your Instagram following. I'm sure you've got people hitting you up online who are just like, I want to go straight to the source. I want to see mm. – what he's personally doing. No one could see what I was personally doing. Like it was hard work to get your own um, endeavors out there when I was on the show. Whereas you can be like, hey, guys, I've got a song dropping. Mm. And you've got however many tens of thousands of folks going, great, we're ready. When's your next song? Come and give it to us. Yeah. You know, it's it's a very different world in that sense. But then there's also a good chunk of the, the population that, they're, yeah, if they're not into it, they're just not into it. They don't need to. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it, it seems like maybe maybe what it is is that, that the fan, the diehard fans, maybe even more diehard yeah. because they can have even more access to you. They can check your socials, yeah, and they can um, they can really be like they live and breathe it. Well, and that's yeah, cool. People have got their thing. A lot of the time, the others. It's like they they see something. They're like, oh, I love your TikTok account, or I love that video you posted the other day, or your story, and so they're all across all of your social media. So yeah, I think you are right with that. Yeah, that's cool. I like that though, man. That was something that I remember I was kind of craving when I was on the show. I was wanting a little bit more, um, I guess, selfishly personal validation. I, you know, I worked hard on my character and you know, my scenes, and 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 I wanted to. I didn't really get as much like, yeah, validation of the work that I was putting in. Whereas, whereas now people can be like, I love what you're doing, man. I love what you did in that scene, and I'm going to send you a message about it on on yeah. Facebook or Instagram or wherever it is and I'm going to support your career because I'm, I've got the notifications on and I'm up to date with everything yeah. that you're putting out there. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's, it's yeah. A, there's a catch-22 with that social media stuff because like, I'm, I TikTok a lot and I've got a lot, probably 
I would say about twice the following on there than I do Instagram now. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's also very fatiguing at the same time. It's another job within itself. And mm. to get your music to be doing really well these days, you've just got to be pumping it. You've got to, you've got to get stuff out all the time. You've got to be hitting, you know, getting in the algorithm. And that can be really fatiguing within itself. Um, yeah. So th- there is a catch to with that stuff. Like I, I, it's great that we have that new opportunity, but at the same time I'm like, it would be nicer if if that wasn't something that another job that we had to do and we could just create our art and just do that. Because I feel like as well, like, I mean, people put videos up on TikTok about it. It's, it, it takes away from like the steez of an artist or like, you know, the, 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 um, the mystery behind an artist, you know, and, and a lot of that was what was cool about people. Like it was very like there was something different that, or you weren't quite sure about what was going on with them and then that's why they were these big stars that people loved, whereas now everything is just so out there and everyone knows everything about everyone's lives. So I just think it's it's very different. It is. That's an interesting observation. I think about that sometimes too, thinking about how in – back before the social media days, we really <clears throat> idolized our celebrities. Mm. We were really taught to kind of, there was that very much celebrity worship because they were so far removed from us. They were, it's like they were, they were a different thing. They weren't human, you know, mm. they were a God almost. Yeah. Whereas now it's, very, very different from that. You, you, you need to be relatable to people because vulnerable. you are not a god. You're nothing remotely close to a god. The more vulnerable and relatable you are, the more people are going to gravitate towards. It's kind of what people want, I think. Mm. Which, which definitely, yeah, requires a lot of work. But I do think it's really, I do think it's more healthy in yeah. the sense that that you kind of, it, 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 if you're if you're smart about it, you won't. You know, you don't develop that godlike complex. Like Laurel, Lolly went and saw Taylor Swift just recently. Now mm-hmm. she's certainly got. Um, a, a, there are people who completely and utterly worship her. Mm. But one of the things that she was, Lol was saying that during the concert, she was talking from a very personal perspective about how she was acknowledging the journey that that each and every one of these eighty thousand people at the gig had gone through to come to the show. Mm-hmm. And and she speaks to these these people, her fans, on a very individual, personal level. And it seems as though she actually can relate to them on an individual level. Which, mm. look, if she's if she's bullshitting, she's very smart about it. But it's probably genuine, and that's really, I think, that's what's working for her. That's why she's yeah. so insanely massive. Yeah, I mean, because I, she was I, she yeah. was always massive, but. You know, I think it's even taken her to a to a further level now as well. Like because people, I didn't realize how massive she was. Dude, she's I, like she's like bigger than the Beatles. It's insane. Like she it is, is insane. huge. And no pressure, eh? And for like you know, I I do I do like some of Taylor Swift's music. I don't mind her music at all. I think she's a fabulous writer. Um, but like you know, <laughs> I, I hear acts like Prince and stuff and mm. things that are where it's just like whoa. This person is from another planet. I just don't get that with Taylor, but I I get no. an, an innate ability to write beautiful songs, but it's very straight down the line pop stuff. But there's not there's nothing. But if you, you know if you put this clip up, we're going to get torn apart. Well, no, that, but that's fine. We're allowed to have our opinion on Taylor Swift. I mean, I'm wearing a silver chair shirt. You're wearing a, the Doors shirt. You're not exactly the, the target audience. You know, I don't really, I don't really care so much if I'm offending any Swifties. It's mm-hmm. not my intention, but I'm allowed to feel the way I feel. Yeah. But, but one thing that's really interesting about her is, and I don't know how she's done this. Let me know if you have any insight into this. She is 35 now? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But And she's been doing this for, Laura was saying, she mentioned in the concert that she's been doing it for 18 years. She's been releasing music. And so... She was releasing music when she was of that age and she was speaking to a certain audience when she first started, right? And that audience is around teenage, tween, mm-hmm. late teen girls. You know, that's predominantly who, who are Taylor Swift fans. But yet now that she's 35, they're still 
the, the, the girls who are now 15, who are 15 now and 12 now, they love her as well, as well as the women who are 35. Mm-hmm. That's, that's unheard of. Like you, mm. that doesn't really seem to happen with most like artists. The, so, yeah, the donut, it's crazy. It's amazing because you think about uh, in Sydney at that gig, Blink-182 were playing actually on the same night just down the road. And I was kind of thinking, you know, I don't have any, any info on this, but I'm just speculating. I don't feel like Blink-182 when they came out and they were big was when I was like, what, 14, 15, you know, so there, and when they were big, their target audience was teenage boys. Mm. But I don't know how many teenage boys now are into Blink-182. Yeah. I don't feel like they're relevant to teenage boys now. Maybe I'm completely well, it's, wrong. It's more because like she's, teenage boys would still listen to Blink-182 and all those, their, their classics and stuff, but the, they're not still releasing music that's in the charts and, you know, and, and killing it where she's just still releasing music. But it's also, I think the biggest thing with her was the resurgence as well after being ripped off by Scooter Braun and that whole thing that happened with her music and all of her albums and then she re-recorded them all and they all mm-hmm. say in Taylor's version. So she's re-released all those albums, her version um so that was like a whole nother story towards her and i guess a lot of it as well is like female kind of you know female power and which is which is really gay like kind of avoiding certain things within the industry and i think she yeah because i mean the poor thing like you've seen that video when she was like 17 and kanye west gets on the stage and he like just abuses her yeah, like, savage. He just was, takes them on. I mean, like, just takes them on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you finish. Anyway, just take. <laughs> Whoa, bro! Wow, yeah, that was that was savage. And look, when Kanye West comes at you, just let him go. Oh. Let him do his thing. <laughs> There's no stopping him. No, because who knows what he's gonna do? That guy is an enigma. I don't. Yeah. He's a he's a fascinating person. He is truly yeah. fascinating. I will always watch a Kanye West interview anything i'll oh, yeah. always say because i'm like what's going to happen here what's going to happen is, this is this is really going to be interesting every time <laughs> my favorite quote is just where he was in an interview and he just says i am a god because i'm a god well, well, yeah yeah well while he's wearing like a front zipped up hoodie and it could be anyone <laughs> you gotta respect it it's, it's hilarious you gotta respect it yeah he's dressed up his next thing he's gonna be dressed up as someone from the fucking blue man group and you want yeah. you know he's yeah he's he's a fascinating person yeah guy. but on the taylor swift to cap up, cap it off i mean i respect her she's just, just a crazy career yeah. um yeah but on the other hand of that i don't quite get how she's so popular i think um, a lot of it just is the straight down the line songwriting and she has a, an ability to write things that a lot of young girls or mid middle-aged girls can relate to i i have another theory too she's she knows who her audience is and she's been very intelligent in 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 um, maintaining that and writing mm. for that, and you know, women who are now in their thirties and forties, they can still relate to when they were um, fifteen year old, a mm. fifteen year old. Um, obviously, guys like Taylor Swift too. That's cool. That's not mainly where she's going for, but like my thirteen year old niece, obsessed, obsessed. Mm. Um, but the other thing is, who's taking the thirteen year old girl to a concert? Her mum, she's not going on her own. And so her mum needs to feel all her dad, you know, her mum or her dad, like like her parents. So they need to feel like they can approve of the music that their children are listening to. And Taylor Swift does not gyrate on stage and dress like a whore. (laughs) Yeah. If I can put it blatantly. You know, like, like I, it's as a parent, I never used to think like this, but now as a parent, I'm like, what kind of, because that has an influence on your kids. Mm. What kind of influence does the music they're listening to or watching have on your little child's mind? Yeah. And if my little daughter is like, oh, daddy, what's I, I want to listen to the song WAP. Mm. I'm going to be like, no, 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 <laughs> because you're a child and that's not appropriate for a child. Like yeah. this, is, this, is, this is not, <laughs> this is not good. Been, I, I still can't get over the fact when you get up what wife and you just read the lyrics but you like just not singing you just read it it's yeah. <laughs> it like, the you're most in the studio obscene... and you're like this is good line yeah it is the most obscene thing that i've 
than I've ever. It's insane. It's, it's amazing. It's actually fascinating. It's it really is. sad that that was such a that that was allowed. Like I love how that's allowed to be out in yeah. in pop culture. That's yeah. okay. But there's all this other stuff that no, you're not allowed to talk about that. You're not allowed to say those mm. kind of things. Yeah. You, yeah. It's 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 a really weird culture is, that we're. But yeah. 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 Anyway, coming back to why I think another reason Taylor's worked because she's she's relatively wholesome. As far mm. as as far as those, those she's a girl next door. Like go. she's the, just a wholesome, yeah. The girl next door, and it's also they can look at her and be like, "Oh, she's amazing," but she's just like us. Yeah, that's the yeah. biggest the biggest thing about her. She's just yeah. like us. It's very different, as we were saying before. How you had all these stars back in the day, and they were these special things put on a, a, a pedestal. Mm. Um, whereas with Taylor, you, you know, she's gorgeous, whatever. But with her personality and everything, it's just like, oh, she's mm. us. Yeah, well, that, that's certainly the um, that's certainly the way it feels. How now? Tell me this: as a musician, she she does a three hour gig every gig, right? And she does four sold out shows in a row. She just did that in Sydney. Apparently, she's just flying to Singapore. I'm only just learning all this shit about Taylor right now. Mm. Like, I've got she's not in my in my ecosystem of what I consume, but you know, my mm. wife's been and my niece is really into it, so I've been learning about Taylor Swift as a musician. How much of her three-hour gig every night do you think she's actually singing compared to what is on? So, so I think she's, she's yeah, exactly. So every single song she's singing, unless it's an acoustic song, everything that she has the band with, it's all with tracks. And that's essentially how a lot of pop stars run it these days is they've always got tracks in there to support them. Um, yeah. Unless it's just her and a piano or her and a guitar, sure, it's her and her own. And then... With those tracks, I mean, I'm just, I'm just purely speaking. I didn't go, but I'm just purely speaking from what I believe is what a lot of artists will do. Um, mm. Justin Bieber's, you know, Kid Laura's, all those sort of artists. They've got the tracks in the background um, yeah. with these big gigs, and then they just kind of jump in and out. And do you know what? Three hours, I would too. <laughs> yeah, well, well, from a from a technical, practical perspective. You got to keep in your voice. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and with her songs, like a lot of the time she sings in that airy sort of middle range voice, so it's not really crazy. But then she does, mm. obviously, she sings up and all the time as well. But, um, mm. yeah, I mean, it's just like she's not singing it's, like soul. Well, the, and here's the other thing. if she, Let's say she is. So I've been doing these, these solo acoustic gigs, right? That's been my main, my main money earner, my main job. Mm. And I would do three, four-hour solo acoustic gigs a week. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three, sorry, four 45 minute sets, um, each, each gig, three days in a row. And obviously I would sing the whole thing. I don't have tracks. It's, yeah. me. <laughs> it's yes. me playing solo acoustic and I can get through it, but not for long because I actually damaged my voice. I had to yeah. take a few months off because I went and got a laryngoscopy and they put the camera down. She was like, you don't have any nodules yet, but you got, you got a blood blister on your vocal fold. And if you are if you are going to keep going, you're going to injure yeah. your voice. It's hard work, and that's man. just yeah, that's just me in a in a bar or at the casino mm. playing some songs acoustically. Yeah, you know, I mean, the stakes I wonder, aren't. That I wonder high. how much of a difference it would be if it was someone because you've got quite a rocker's voice, so you've got a little bit of rasp and stuff in there too, and you've got a you use distortion every now and then in those gigs, right? So, yeah, I mean, I do tend sometimes I get carried away and I do push it a bit more than mm. I should, but. But I mean, I'm doing things like I tune my guitar down three semitones so yeah. that it's so that I've got I capo up if I need to, but I've got that extra room. I've got all these tricks that I do to try and preserve my voice, and still it's I've had lot, to cut man. back on the gigs. It's too just, many gigs. It's, yeah, it's so much. I, but, I I used to struggle with the three forty five minute ones towards the yeah. end. So so that's why as a as and I you know I know you know this when you are someone who actually does it and you hear that oh. Taylor Swift is doing three-hour gigs. Yeah, it's very different. Four nights in a row. Uh, is she? And and also, there's like <laughs> fucking billions of dollars that is being spent on her to turn up and perform. Mm. There's no way that they are taking the chance on just letting her sing the whole no. thing. You it's, can't. It can't. It's too it's, much at stake. It's a spectacle. Like I saw the show and it looked amazing. It's a show. I saw yeah. it and like everyone's got their colored wristbands or whatever. And 
it, there's a lot of distractions to take you away from the fact of when she is and isn't singing. And she would, you know, she can just say something to the crowd and then she can put the microphone down. She can walk around. Mm. People don't mm. care. They no. don't care. It's because not what it is. Her songs are so anthony. Did you see, like, you see the videos and stuff? It's like everyone's singing every lyric of every song. You can't song. even hear her singing. Like, why anyway. is she there? It's all this. <laughs> It is actually like what happened with the Beatles. The Beatles, apparently, they stopped playing live because you couldn't hear them. Oh, wow. The PAs weren't, back then, the PA systems weren't powerful enough to be able to be over the crowd. And they would, when a song would finish and they would try and talk, you could hear nothing because it was, it was just people screaming, just mm. actual screaming like they were being murdered. Well, I just, it, yeah, that, like 90,000 or eight, 80 to 90,000 in that MCG studio, three nights she did it. That's that's insane. Like that's insane. That's a big, big, big deal. No pressure, huh? <laughs> yeah, I know. But like you know, props to her, and we would yeah. we would give uh, left nut to be there, <laughs> doing exactly what yeah. she's doing. No, that that oh, would be. Oh man, what a what an experience! What a feeling! But again, like yeah, she's a she's a she's a just a human, just like we are, and it's. She she seems to be to be riding that wave very well. Like what, could, man? Could you imagine trip? though, just standing on the stage in front of like ninety thousand people, and they're singing your lyrics back that over the years, that every single song that you sing re- represents a certain time in your life. Like you would just have so many different emotions coming to. It would just it would be unreal. Like I'm surprised she's yeah. not depressed because of the dopamine hits that she would be constantly getting from these shows. You know what I mean? Oh, well, this is, and I was going to talk about that. That's a great point. Like how, how does one keep their shit together? Because exactly that one, how do you not become a complete narcissist? Because everyone around you thinks that you're the best thing that's ever existed. And, and two, exactly how, what, what happens to your your um yeah i'd like to health. know what's it like i'd yeah. like to know what's her what's her routine like what's her lifestyle like <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's uh um it's uh, i wonder because you know people like justin bieber was the same um he had yeah. so much fame when he was young and, and middle-aged women and people throwing themselves at, had, at him and mm. there was so much of that dopamine just constantly everywhere he'd go he got anything he wanted and then he got to the point where he was just he was just done and he, yeah. he just he first went off the rails and then he was just cooked for a while and had to take some time out. And you see it in his, in his documentaries. And I'm just like, you know, it would have been great when he first started, but it, it also looked horrendous, you know, not having any control over your own life. He does seem to be on a bit of a spiritual journey. These yeah, days, he's, he? he's like a real churchy and he seems to be a real great mentor to lots of younger artists too. And I think he's really turned out to be like, from the outside looking in a great person he's one of those yeah. um he's one of those real skilled guys too he's like just real good at like hockey and ice skating and basketball oh, skating yeah, yeah. like yeah he's just a, he's just a real natural talented guy at just everything he does mm. seems like yeah how how you how you go through that and come out the other side there's no one well not no one but there's there's practically no one to teach you how to do it. Mm. Like like the amount of people that are given the opportunity, well, not given, but are who are who have the opportunity and who live the life of someone like um, Justin Bieber, Miley Cyrus, Taylor Swift, Macaulay Culkin, you know, these people who are, especially from young age, it's just few and far between. So, and... So there's not really many people to sit, be able to sit down and go, hey, this is how you do this effectively without getting completely cooked. Mm. And then, and the other thing is, most of them don't make it through. Like, look at Britney Spears. What, I, what's happened? And, she, and it makes perfect sense. She's, she appears to just be just that's broken. A, her. That's a, yeah, it's an interesting thing that, hey, I just, yeah, real. Yeah, she, it's too much. It's too another, much to handle. It's another big can of worms that I'm just like, what happened there? <laughs> Yeah, you know? yeah, and we would never know, but it, mm. it seems as though, and like, because she, we know we all, when she had that breakdown, right? And she shaved her head, and she came out and lashed out at all the paparazzi, and was she put on a bunch of weight, and just, mm. just, it's almost like she was like, okay, I've been, I've been pitched as this sex symbol, as this beautiful 
um, thing. So I'm going to rebel against that. I'm going to yeah. sabotage well, and that. There's all there's also the element of her father involved with it that everyone talks about as mm. well. And so there was that whole thing. And then, yeah. But then again, now you look at it from the outside, and you're like, was her father? trying to protect her from what's obviously going on with her now. I don't know. You just never know. I, don't, I have no idea. So it's a very yeah. interesting interesting case, that one. It is, yeah. Once again, yeah, someone that we put on this godlike level who mm. really is not. They're a person well, mate, who is. It almost happened to me months, mate, when I played my manly gig and I had one bloke yelling out from the bar. Oh, yeah. He, and I just yeah, he was doing it. He was a man. He came to all your gigs, didn't he? Mate, there's a few. They still message me. Uh, shout out Brad and the boys. They still yeah. message me like, when are you going to play Wicked Game? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do, you I, do a mean I, Wicked Game? I'll give I you remember, that. remember I used to play those gigs in Mandel all the time and they came to my gig with a crown and gave it to me during the middle of my gig and said, King of Manly. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now, well, what more do you need? They're a crack up. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I've just been living on a high ever since. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> The dopamine. Or, yeah, that, that's that's in, like, like that's that's like um like the Buddhist teaching of nirvana. You know, you've reached it. You're there. Exactly. Yeah. I'm I'm waiting for the crash. Yeah. No, never going to happen. You've <laughs> you've achieved it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Bro. So, what do you got? Um, what do you got coming up? Mu- what what music wise? You got you you got some new fresh tunes coming out. So yeah, I, I, musically, um, I've had like a whole EP that I recorded um, with my buddy Nick at his house. He's a great producer and songwriter, um, and obviously friends as well. So I got one song called Sold, which is going to be coming out Good Friday, um, and after that, I've got another two songs that are going to be singles that I want to get out this year. Um, one of them is one of the, I think, the best song I've ever written. So I'm really excited for that one. Um, cool. And it's got the Elton John influence and stuff in it. And it's got an Elton John melody, actually, which we approached his team um, and asked if we could use it. And they came back and said yes. So, oh, you wow. know, the big thing that's going to be real cool is have my song on Spotify and you go to song credits and have Elton John in there. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, man, we worked really hard on, like, just trying to craft a sound and find out what was going to be me and tested a lot of these songs out of the gig last year. And, um, yeah, just really excited to get stuff out. I've got, you know, new management on board. And so we're just trying to really – slam the TikTok and and build the following online to just get as many mm. ears on the music as possible because that's the hardest thing is getting your ears on it. I may you may have all these yeah. followers, but it's just uh, how how do you translate that? So um yeah, but um my next single sold I'm really excited for. So um yeah, it's gonna be it's 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 gonna be a good one. Awesome. That's mm. cool man. That's exciting. And so where where do we go? Where where do I send folks to find you? What's the best place? Um, so Spotify, Matt Evans, app, iTunes, Matt Evans. If you're, you're listening on SoundCloud, D, it's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. Okay. Everywhere. Cool. You name it. You name it you and know? your Instagrams and your, and your TikToks are. They're both. Um, all, at, all those. At this is Matt Evans for both of them. Yeah. Okay. The one and only, because Matt Evans was the, taken, you know. Yeah. Well, same, same with, same with Mark first, but Mark got a weird name. Who the hell's taken my name? What's yours? Mine, I had to go the Mark Furs, which oh, that's, sounds sounds yeah. pretty arrogant. But um, I mean, there was I was I was cycling through trying to come up with a less a less arrogant up myself name, but know. that was the only and half decent one that was available. I, of course, I knew there was going to be another Matt Evans out there. There's millions of them because Evans is. I didn't know that Furs was a common last name. Well, it's I not. Thought, I thought it was a random name generator off Google. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Mark, Mark Furs. Sorry, who? Furs. Are you? Furs? Are you having a laugh? Are you having a laugh? But and it's amazing how many people get my name wrong. Furze? 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 Like, I would read it and be like, Furze? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I should just drop the E, then it makes more sense. No, that would, that would be whack. <laughs> furry. Change it to furry. Mark Furry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll start dressing like one as well. And and then your daughter's name Soma Furs is one of the most unique names I've ever heard. Yeah, that is actually that is actually a weird 
a weird combo. And she, what's know. her middle name? Jade. Soma Jade Furs. It's nice. Thank you. Yeah, I like it. She's going to have she, she's going to have all kinds of of weird people getting her name wrong for her whole life. Yeah, well, I'm Matthew David John Evans, so I sound like I'm out of a boring. Bible. Yeah. I was like to mum, I was like, we're not white, but that's the whitest name I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> You're pretty white. Well, yeah, what's your background yeah, well, again? Dad's from England, so dad's English. Um, yeah. So he's Jonathan Charles Ev- Evans and, you know, so that's – but mum's side is it, – yeah, it's Seychelles, so – and my great-grandfather was Indian, so it's like Indian Creole. Um, okay. And then, yeah, mum was, mum was born here and then her dad was Australian, so – but there's also got to be a bit of rodent in there somewhere because your eyes are a bit too close together. They're too close, and we've always spoken about this. Never trust a man whose eyes are this close together. And watch out. I'm a snake. Snake. That's, that's what Dad always says to me. Yeah, <laughs> snake. Yeah. All right, yeah. Evans. Mate, right, mate, I love you, man. I'm really Good. proud of you. You're doing great things. Keep working. Thanks, and, bud. Uh, yeah, it's been awesome to have you on, mate. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Great to chat to you, bro. See you later. Take care. Cheers, brother. You, you. You.